فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم نعم ان شاء الله تعالى we are now going to speak about and talk about the second point which is التعريف باشهر المصطلحات الجدليه we're going to be speaking about the most common terms in which the scholars of ilm al-jadal use in arguments there are terms that they use when you're reading these books these are the terms that you need to observe okay we spoke about what jadal meant already we've already spoken about that so we don't need to define it so we'll start with the first one which is al-had the word had means in english definition that's what it really means the word had definition and in ilm al-jadal and even in a debate you really have to you really have to what do you call it be strong and solidified when it comes to the matter concerning uh, or the concept pertaining to uh, definition you can't allow in any way form or shape people just people to just come and introduce wordings as they wish so so basically there are four conditions for a definition to be right if you don't come with these four definition four four conditions then really you haven't really defined what you're saying to me the first one is an yakuna jami'an mani'an so the first condition is an yakuna jami'an mani'an that it has to be comprehensive and it also has to prevent other things from it it has to be jami' and it also has to be what it also has to be mani' jami' mani' okay what it means is jami' is that it's comprehensive your definition of this thing so what you're defining is called mu'arraf mu'arraf is what you're defining this thing that you're defining you properly define it with comprehensive terms and also it has to be mani' Mani' means that it has to eliminate anything else that might fall under your definition. So, for example, if I'm defining what a what, uh, sorry uh, uh, phone is, if I say that it's an electricity, and I leave it there, and I say it's an electricity gadget, have I really let out other things? For example, micro, uh, microwave is the same. Micro, microwave is uh, it's uh, it's electricity. Uh, cooker is electricity. Are you, I have, my definition hasn't really got rid of other things as well. Does that make sense, brothers? So the definition to be right, it has to be jami' comprehensive, and it also has to be mani' meaning other things don't are not allowed to enter into that definition of yours. That's the first. The second thing for your definition to be right is the word that you're defining or what you're defining can't be in the definition itself. That's very important. So you're defining something. What you're defining can't be in the definition itself. So if you're defining a mobile phone. You can't somehow, within the definition, bring the word mobile in there. Does that make sense? Because this scholars call it a door. A door means what? We're going to go in circles all day. Yeah? It's a circular argument, right? In other words, we're just going to keep going in circles all day. So you can't define a word and have that same word in the definition. Okay? That's incorrect when it comes to defining. The second thing is, oh, sorry, the third thing is, when you're, uh, the condition of definition is, that the definition or the thing that you're defining you have to define it's that its essence and you're not allowed to define what comes out from it so when we're defining a phone we actually define it based on what it is as an essence the definition is not allowed to be the reward or the outcome of it okay so for example some people when they define wajib They'll say to you, wajib is what you get rewarded for if you do it, and if you stay away from it, you get punished. That's not a definition of the word. That's just uh, the outcome of what will happen to you if you leave a wajib, or if you come with a wajib. Okay? The correct definition of it is, is, is what the sharia requests from you to do, or Allah requests from you to do, or the Prophet requests from you to do in a forceful manner. Okay? That's wajib now. Okay? As for reward or punishment, that's the results. That's the that's the that's the athar. And you don't define it like that. That's incorrect. Are you with me, brothers? 
And Abu Mudhafar Sab'ani Rahimahullah, he talks about that in his kitab, Qawatu'ul Adilla. The fourth is, the fourth is, when you're defining, or in your definition, words that you're defining it with have to be more clearer than the thing that you're defining. So for instance, somebody asked you, what is a hizabra? I asked you, what's a hizabru? Hizabru. Akhi, what does that mean? And you say to me, oh, hizabru. You don't know? It's a gadamfar. So now, I didn't know what hizabra means. And now you brought a word even more hard and more complicated than the word that I wanted to know. Does that make sense? So when you're defining it, you can't define it with a more complicated terms in the definition. The, de the terms that you're using to define it have to be very simple words. Easy terms. Are you with me? With those four conditions, that is a definition that's right then. Are you with me, brothers? <coughs> definition is good now. That's the first thing they deal with in Jadal, Ilmul Jadal, debates. And this is also dealt with in what? Ilmul Mantiq. The second thing is another. You hear this term is used a lot. So I'm just going to mustalahat, we're learning terms that are coined by scholars of Ilmul Jadal. The word another. What does it mean? That word you'll see it a lot. Another means at ta'amul wa tafakkur. Your thinking, your thinking process, your observation of something is called another. The reason why you're thinking and you're pondering here is to reach what? لِمَعْرِفَةِ حَقِيقَةِ أَوْ مَعْرِفَةِ آثَارِ أَوْ إِسْبَعِي The reason why you're doing this, you're looking at this thing and you're pondering over it is so you can reach the bottom of the reality of what this thing is. You want to get to the bottom of its reality. Or you even want to know the out, the effects that come out from this thing. Or you even want to know the causes for it. So all of that is basically what it means another when they say it. So it revolves around two meanings, another التأمل والتفكر Observation and thinking about something. That's what another another means. Uh, as Imam, uh, Imam, uh, Imam al-Bajjah rahimahullah mentions. The third term that you see they use in a lot is ilm al-jadal, the word ilm. They use that word ilm, knowledge. It's used a lot. And as we already previously spoke about Ilm is something that has three things present in it. Are you there? It's idraku shay. So you have to perceive something. Alama huwa as it is, which is the third, second. And the third one is jaziman. And that perception has to be with unwavering conviction. So anything which you could say that these three are present, you've now got knowledge of that thing. First of all, do you have a perception of that thing? If you're saying, oh, I haven't perceived anything of it, then that means it's ignorance. And that's called the simple type of ignorance. It's called simple type of ignorance. It's called Jahnul Basit. Somebody comes up to you and says to you, do you know what a mobile phone is? And you say, I don't know. What is it? You've never heard of it before. There's no perception in your head regarding it. You have no idea of what this, what this thing is. This is called Jahlum Basit, simple term, simple ignorance, which we're going to come to, which is the, the fourth term. But ilm here is perception and the perception that you have and the reality in front of you are both in color, cor, uh, correlation. They are in agreement. They are in line with each other. Your perception here in your brain and the reality that's in front of you are the same. Now, in ilmul jadal, pay attention. This is the place where these people who are debating with you want to sway themselves into. They want to open doubts between your perception and the reality of what's in front of you. So a lot of the times the tactics that they would use against you is, they will say to you, this person that you see right in front of you, how do you know he's there? Just like you perceive when you're driving on a hot day, the mirage, the water is right in front of you, you think there's water there. So how do, how do you know that this is not the same? Do you see my point? So that's what they try to do. And this is the things that a person has to understand. Your perception and the thing you're perceiving, the waqa, the reality in front of you, are they both in line with each other? Does that make sense, brothers? So, is idraku shay ala ma huwa alayhi idraq al jaziman? And so, my perception, the reality, and then what comes out of that is certainty. I am certain about this. I'm not in doubt. I am 100 percent sure that what I'm looking at right now are students, and I'm not just talking to no one. And I'm certain about that. 
then if you doubt, they can't mess with, they won't, because you've got a perception already, they can't get rid of you saying, I don't have a perception. So they won't, they won't succeed in that. Or they will try to succeed in it though, is if they can say to you that your perception is null and void, it's not reality. And once you say it's not, they doubt, you doubt the reality, then they are, you're open for doubt now. That's where doubt comes in. So you doubt something. And you no longer have of this thing any knowledge of it whatsoever. Jahal comes into place now. Ignorance, which is the fourth. The fourth term that they would use again, ignorance. This word is used a lot. Jahal, 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 Jahal. Jahal is of two types. The first one, I already explained it to you, is Basit. And it basically means Adamul idraki bil kulliya. The person doesn't have no perception at all. Somebody asks you, what's this? You say, Allahu A'lam. I don't know what this is. I have no knowledge of what you're holding in your hand right now. I have no knowledge. This is called what? That's Jahlum Basit. The reason why they call it simple ignorance is because perception can be installed in people's minds. Pay attention. This is why it's very strong. Perception. Why is perception easy? Because the fitrah is easy. Do you see my point? So that's why it's simple. I can easily tell you, actually, this is a phone. Really? Oh, the person will take it. So it's simple. To cure that kind of ignorance is very easy. The second one is compounded. There is a perception, but the reality and that perception are two different things. It's hard to tell the person what you're perceiving is not what's out there right now. For instance, he'll say to you, this is a, uh, a watch. Okay? And so you say to him, no, it's not a watch, it's a phone, it's a mobile phone. So he'll, he'll bring his arguments now. That's when it becomes compounded ignorance. And it's very hard to remove it. Because there's a perception and there is a thought of what he believes that to be the reality. Which is not intact with one another. So the way that they try to come to is the reality. Okay? And this is where Ilm al-Jadal really focuses highly on. Okay? Then there's a fifth term that are used a lot by, uh, it's one of the most common words, Mustalahat al jadaliyah that is used. The most common uh, debate terms are used is khitab. You hear that word a lot. And it, those are the words that creep into usul al-fiqh and stuff like that, khitab. Khitab means, it's the words that are used by the one who's talking to reach a meaning to the other person who he's talking to. That's what it basically means. So I'm using words in which I'm speaking with. And those terms that I'm using, the words that I, those words that I'm using, the intent behind those words that I'm using is I'm trying to basically reach a goal with it. In other words, in English, it's called addressing. You're trying to address this person with something. You're trying to make them, so it's, that's called khitab. This is a stilah that they use and when you see it in their books, you need to keep an eye out for what they, what, what, what's meant by that. There's another term, the sixth one they use is called luzum. Luzum. Luzum basically means a relationship between two things that if one is found, the other is found. There's a relation, so the luzum means tarabutu amraini bihaythu idha wujida ahaduhuma wujida al-akharu. Two things. That if one is found, the other automatically, by default, is found. I'll give you an example of that. But, so the, the, sorry, the way that this one happens is in two ways. The talazum is that if this is found, this is found. Does that make sense? So if A is found, B is found. So we said that the term that's used is called luzum. Luzum basically means the relationship between two things. A is related to B. But it happens in two ways. Okay? The relationship sometimes is from A to B. And sometimes it's A to B to B to A. <coughs> so it's from A to B and B to A as well. So sometimes it can be both ways, and sometimes it can only be one way. One way relationship. The example for the both way relationship is, if for example you say, so and so is the father of so and so. So what does that mean? That's a two-way relationship. The relationship here is that the father, he's the father of this son, and the son is the son of his father. So it's a two-way relationship here. So if you come to me and you say to me, I'm a son, 
By default, I know a father exists. And if a, f a father comes up to me and says, I'm a father, I by default know that a son exists. So there's a two-way relationship. So we don't need to, we, you just need to mention one, and the other one's already there for both of us to acknowledge and to agree on. That's A to B. That's A to B, B to A. That's a both-way one. So father to son, son to father. The second one, on the other hand, is basically min jihatin wahida. Only one way is the relationship going. And that is, for example, if somebody has knowledge, then he lives. He's alive, right? But not everyone who's alive has got knowledge. So one way, sah? The relationship between knowledge and life. For example, if so-and-so is a scholar, you say to him, he's a scholar, a person of knowledge, I know he lives, he has to live. But not everybody who lives is a scholar, so there's no two-way relationship on that issue. That's needed in debates, which is called a luzum. Somebody can't debate with you something that has luzum min jihataini, from two angles. We can't have it as a discussion as though it is a talazum, bain, uh, talazum which is min jihatin wahida from only one, one, one way. Does that make sense? Another one that they use, the seventh one, is called a tanafi. It's called a tanafi. A tanafi basically means the opposite of what we just mentioned, which is talazum. Talazum means that they are what? There's a relationship, there's a connection between the two. Tanafi, on the other hand, what it means is that they're basically they are on two opposite poles. Then they can never be together. Are you there, brothers? <coughs> For example, if one is there, the other one can't be there. It's impossible. They are opposing each other. So once you say and you state these characteristics and this attribute, or you mention this, I by default know that the opposite can't be there. For example, sifa to sam'i, the hearing. It opposes death. So a person can't hear, if he's hearing me, he's alive. Are you with me, brothers? Giving birth. In a, they had a child. You just said they had a child. By all default, it gets rid of the kuriya. He's not a male. It's not a male. It's a female. You didn't tell me that. But the word wilada, child, birth, gets rid of the idea of it being a male. This is called a tanafi. Debate is very strong, this tactic. And in discussions. Things that oppose one another. Because these people, what they try to do is two things that are impossible for it to come together will come together. Like nothing becomes something. The eighth one is called al-haq. Al-haq is naqid al batil It's the opposite of falsehood. And what it means is that it's the correct thing. In a debate, there has to be something that which is haq. There has to be something that is the truth. Every single body who is debating believes something is the haq. The atheist believes that something is the haq. So for him, that's the concrete argument that he's trying to use. Are you with me? And everything other than what he is saying, he believes is the falsehood. Are you with me? But the question here, are you with me? Is that it's the concept of we'll speak to about that when we spoke about khata and stuff like that, don't worry. The ninth term that is used is the word aqal. Aql is tend to be used a lot. And they use that word a lot. And it has many meanings, by the way. It's not just one meaning. Sometimes they use the word aql and they mean by it. Alhamdulillah. <coughs> they mean al aql which is called al aql al gharizi'u. Al aql al gharizi'u means what? The aql al gharizi basically means the aql that's in every single body, normal, sanity. Aql which is the natural disposition one. That is the one that everybody shares, the smart one, the dim-witted one, the rich one, the poor one, the scholar, the ignorant one. This aql everyone has. Sometimes they mean that with that aql. Sometimes they mean the aql which is referred to as the tajarub al-khibrat. A person who's got, he has tajarub, experience. This person has gained a lot of experience, traveled the world. 
So that's like sometimes they will say to istafid min aqli fulan, benefit from the person's aql here. They mean min khibrati. They're not saying that you don't have an aql. You do, but you don't have uh, khibra that he has here. Sometimes the aql means a person who has ma'rifatu awaqib al umur wa ma'alat al af'al. A person who's, who's smart enough to see the outcome of things. They're smart enough to know that this action, the repercussions that come from it, are they in favor of us or are they going to be against us? It's the third one. The third one is uh, 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 this aql is basically ma'rifatu awaqib al umur, knowing the outcome, the repercussions of things and actions. So, for example, they will say to you, Fulanun aqil. So and so is aqil, meaning he's smart. He basically knows what? The ending of things and how things are going to happen. The tenth thing that they use a lot is su'al. Question. Su'al. Su'al is very commonly used, that word. It's from the very common used word according to them. And what su'al basically means is two meanings for them. It carries two meanings. The first meaning that it carries is, it is the speech that clarifies for you something that's hidden. And sometimes su'al means for them, al-i'tiradu ala al-akhareen. It means you're opposing this person, a position of this person is a su'al as well. You might be asking them, but you're asking here is a position, and it's what we re refer to as um, istifham, which is inkari. Are you with me? When Allah says in the Quran, Alayhi Sallahu bi ahkamil hakimin. You see, this is a question, it's a su'al, but this is a position and refuting and debunking the opponent and what they're saying. Okay? The eleventh term that they use a lot is called al-jawab, response. Okay? They use that word response. And what an answer. Jawab here means to basically clarify a meaning of a question that was put to you. So if you're not clarifying it, you haven't given an answer. So the person has the right to say, I need an answer from you. Al-Mujadal, you hear that a lot. They'll use that question, but you haven't given an answer. The answer is clarification. If you've not clarified the meaning which you were asked, you haven't answered the question. Are you there? And this is where the majority of the times you find in debates, people don't do that. They don't answer the question. They make it look like they've answered a question. They've not answered the question you put to them. So then again, it's the art of being able to make sure that the person is answering the question. And you can only tell them to answer the question when you know what an answer is. An answer is, Clarify the meaning of a question or the question I asked you. The question I asked you. So the question I asked you is what you need to clarify for me. Not a question of something else that tends to happen. A lot. Sometimes what they also call jawab is دَفْعُ muarada. Somebody may open, you won't ask the question, but you can see a path that a person may tread on to get you out later or bring a question regarding it. So you basically block off that door or you block off that narrow road from them. So it's, it's, called, it's also called a jawab. Are you with me brothers? Istishad is also the other word that they use, it's the twelfth word. It's called al-istishad. Istishad simply means um, witness, requesting for a witness. So if a person claims something, you just say to him, what's your shawahid, what's the witness for this? What can testify to this that you've just claimed? So they call it, huwa talabul muwafiq This which you're claiming now and you're say, stating, is there anything that you have to go hand in hand with it? This is called istishad. Um, the thirteenth term that's used is idwal ilzam. Ilzam is used. We mentioned previously luzum. Now ilzam is something else. What ilzam means is that when you're talking to the person, you make them submit a speech that you're putting down for them. So you make them submit. Okay? In other words, sometimes you know when, when you're having a dialogue with people or discussion, they already know from what you're going to say, it's going to necessitate and it's going to narrow them down to accept that. Are you with me? 
So what happens to them is what's called in ilmul jadal ifham. He becomes quiet. So you're saying to them, so if you say this, and you say this, this is what, they, do you accept that? He, see, it's called ilzam now. You're, you're, you're making him submit to and uh, accept from the, your, as opponent from you um, something that you're putting forward to him. The 14th mm -hmm. thing is called um, musadarati. Musadarati means when the person basically um, he basically uses the claim itself as an evidence. Musadara means an istidlalu bi'ayni da'awa. You're using something as a claim and you are told to bring a witness for it. Instead of bringing a witness, you use the claim itself as a witness. Okay? And that's incorrect. The da'awa, the claim, stands by itself. Are you there? It can't be a witness. It requires a witness. So sometimes in debates this happens. So when you're in the debate, you'll say to the person, هذا مصادرة. يا أخي هذا مصادرة. That's مصادرة. And a lot of the time this happens on something uh, that Sa'ad you were asking me before. It's basically, it comes from Natija to Dalili. The person deducts, he deducts, are you there? Evidence. Are you with me? And he makes the results that he brought one of the muqaddimah at the introduction. Sah? So a person will be basically being, he will reduce for you. Like for example, when you're debating an atheist and you say God said, he said first before God, that's a natija. We have to, that means we've already accepted God exists. This is his word. This is a natija. That's musadara. This is musadara. Are you with me, brothers? The natija that you're using here, natija to dalil, you're making it as a muqaddimah. Then basically after that you use that as an introduction, then you're going to build your case against it. So if the person says to you, this is a natija to dalil, which you're using it as what? Ihda muqaddimatihi. Are you with me? So you say it's natija to lam natafiq ali. We didn't even agree on the natija, so I can use it as a muqaddimah, as an introduction. Naam, Zakaria. Yeah, an atheist right there. He doesn't believe in God, so this is not an evidence for him. Qalbu. The 15th will... It's up to really a lot of terms. Um, the terms that are... That they use and that they speak about. And they are the, the most... They're, just, they're not just random terms, but they're actually the most common terms that they use. It's actually 55. But we'll just stop at 15, inshallah, which is... This is the last one, inshallah ta'ala. And the rest will take question and answers. And the rest, if we see them inside the book, we'll explain it. If we don't, we will leave it for another time. The second one is called Al-Qalb, which is the last one. The 15th one is called Al-Qalb. Qalb is when you turn their evidence as an evidence for yourself. What you do is you, the evidence he was using for himself turned out to be an evidence for you. And this was something Ibn Taymiyyah was very profound with. He said, nobody ever uses an evidence except I can use that evidence against them. Okay? And this is something he took from the Qur'an itself. Allah did it, subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the... When the... Uh, um, when the... Uh, munafiqoon said, لا يخرجن الأعز منها الأدل That the strong ones, the honorable ones, are going to take out the humiliated, weak ones. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he turned the evidence against them. And he made that dalil Delil against the munafiqeen rather than it being a delil for them and Allah says وَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةُ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ You're right. The honorable ones are going to take the humiliated ones out. You guys are the humiliated ones. And the honorable ones that are going to be taken out is Allah and His Messenger Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the last one. Shaykh Ibrahim, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? So inshaAllah ta'ala we're going to conclude there by idhni Allah al-Kareem. This is the last and final uh, point. And if inshallah ta'ala on Saturday, uh, we can maybe do the rest of the remaining. That would be good. Because I think this is very important. We should write. So okay, what we'll do is inshallah ta'ala on Saturday. Before we start the book, we'll finish off these terms. And then we'll go into the book inshallah ta'ala. Uh, anything which I have said that was wrong or incorrect is from me and shaitan. Allah his message are free from it. Subhanak Allah wa bihamdik. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله استغفرك وأتوب إليه. anyone anyone have any questions